Good afternoon all on this very, very wet Friday afternoon. As Uncle Mort, one of the commenters on YouTube, has already put it, window watch, rain, rain and more rain. But we're going to stick to the football. Dave Freezer here alongside Paddy Davitt. We'll also bring this to you on the Pink and Podcast audio stream and Future Radio 107.8 FM. But Pad, how are how you doing? How are you enjoying the uh, the Euros so far? We're, uh, we're all looking forward to, to England-Scotland tonight, aren't we? And seeing how, uh, seeing how Hanley gets on. I, I watched their game against Czech Republic the other day, actually, and I thought Overall, Grant was was pretty good, but he's, I, I searched his name on Twitter as you do at half time, um, uh, and he was getting loads and loads of praise before the goal when he was beaten by about two centimeters in the air or whatever by a forty million pound striker. But after the goal, all of a sudden, he was the worst player in the world. <laughs> well, it's funny you should say that, Dave. This is almost as if we've we've chatted prior to rather than me rushing to join you on on screen. But um, I've literally in the last hour just put some quotes up along. Those lines, Steve Clark, Scotland coach, uh, asking elements of the Tartan army to lay off him because he clearly, as you referenced there, he feels like he's a bit of a Marmite character. It would have, it would appear, you know, some clearly don't fancy him at the heart of Scotland's central defence with Foden and uh, Sterling and Kane running at him tonight. But uh, it's not as if they've got a huge amount of other options, is it, in that area of the park? And uh, anybody who watched him in from a distance in green and yellow this uh, this past season. I think you'd, you'd feel that's a little bit harsh. Yes, of course, as you rightly said there, you're not playing £40 million strikers in the Championship most weeks, or, or, or if at all. But um, I, I think he's a he's a player who you probably appreciate if you see him a, a bit more regularly. than uh, Because you look at him and what do you see? You see a very almost throwback type centre-back, a big powerhouse of a defender. Um, and then you probably make some misconceptions from, from what you see. But... Ultimately, for me, he's, he's a better defender than uh, I can't think there's another Scottish centre back who should be playing ahead of him. So uh, I'm not quite sure why they, you know, there's one or two who are choosing to single him out. Yes, he could have done better in the air, but um, you saw by that lad's Patrick Schick's second goal, 50 yard lob over David Marshall. He, he looks a bit of a special player, that lad. So yeah. I don't think it was, I don't think you could, you could really you know, extrapolate from one aspect of that game that Grant Hanley didn't really perform. Because Steve Clark again, in that piece that's gone up on the pink, and he, he felt he was outstanding in the second half, you know, when Scotland were pushing forward and leaving themselves a little bit exposed at the back. His pace, again, you don't associate with that with Grant Hanley if you don't see him week in, week out, but he has excellent pace. Daniel Farker always talks about there's only probably Poeta in the in the squad who's quicker than him over a certain period of of distance, so his, his passing range has got far better. Working with Daniel Farker, he's, he's much more accomplished on the ball. Um, I, I think that's very, very harsh to, to be singling him out for criticism. Um, given it's not as if they've got Virgil van Dijk in the wings, is it? If you're Scotland or, or uh, you know, uh, Harry Maguire, even, but um, we'll see. You know, I'm sure that most England fans, slash Norwich fans, will hope he plays well individually tonight. Um, but obviously, England get the result. Um, I, I think they are a, a little bit limited, Scotland, in terms of the attacking side of the game. And ultimately, that's probably, I mean, you know, it's a derby essentially tonight. So I don't subscribe to the theory England will romp this game. I think it'll be a pretty tight game. But you do feel England's creative output compared to Scotland's chalk and cheese. So, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that one. But um, just hope on a personal level that he has a good game because uh, anybody who watched him this season, past season, he was pretty influential really you know um and that was recognized with his position in terms of the player of the year rating uh by Norwich fans they've seen enough of him to know that he's a probably an underrated player but um hey ho you know Scott if Scotland fans need convincing that's that's up to them but I'm pretty sure Norwich fans wouldn't be Julian concerned uh if he was leading the team out against Liverpool come August the 14th weekend as we discovered midweek yeah, I thought his use of possession, you could see that that's a Farker player playing amongst quite limited players other than maybe McTominay's good in his day, McGinn I like, Andrew, Andrew Robinson would definitely be the England team if he was English. He's an outstanding player, isn't he? But anyway, we'll park that. It, just, it always makes me laugh that people do judge books by cover, don't they? <laughs> you know, Grant Hanley, always a big centre-back, he's not quick. And then, you know, Norwich fans have known that for years. Just remember the equaliser against Ipswich in what, 2018, when he uh, kept, keeps the ball in before the Tim Closer goal and stuff. It's, he, he is quick. There's no doubt about it. So yeah. move on, everyone. Anyway, we've got loads of comments coming in uh, already. Terry Wogan on YouTube, apparently. Good afternoon, gents. 
please bless me with some good news so we can get this transfer window going. Well, Pad, we have seen a deal done. Uh, it's the first loanee going out of, of many, no doubt, as we're very used to now. Neil Adams is normally looking after about 20, 25 players over the course of the season, isn't he? Reese McAleer heading up to Inverness Caledonian Thistle, so Scottish Championship level. We only saw him briefly, didn't we, in, in one championship game? We did, yeah. Um, so I, I can't really pass judgment on on the lad, but he's clearly highly thought of. Um, I saw some quotes from the Inverness manager, basically sort of alluding to what Norwich paid for him um, relative to his age. So there's a player there, but I think with with there'll be a common theme with any player who leaves Norwich this summer on loan, and that is essentially that they're not good enough for Norwich in the Premier League right here, right now. That isn't to say that they could down the line, but. Uh, you know, it makes perfect sense. And ultimately, that's it. as you touched on there with Neil Adams' status, that's a key, key plank of Norwich's, well, you know, development of players, essentially. Um, we've seen it with Todd Cantwell in the past, uh, you know, who went out and benefited hugely. And now look at him, you know, an integral member of Daniel's first team. Uh, nice cut, by the way. Um, and also we've got, yes. you know, we've got lads who... Are probably a bit closer to Daniel's consideration. That that for me is the Omabama Dailies and the Adam Eders of this world, and obviously you know Josh Martin to an extent last season, and they won't go out. So you know there's a twin track approach with those development talents if we want to label them that. And I think this guy, um, he is a teenager, isn't he? Still, or is, if not very early in, into his twenties. Yeah, so, I think. Yeah, so um, you know he's he's not going to be anywhere near Norwich's first team. Go and play in the Scottish Championship. That's that's the. The, the key really to it and Neil Adams has touched on this did a big interview towards the end of this well in the summer uh, just after the end of the season to Norwich's official site and there is an art to placing players because they're all slightly different ages and slightly different stages of their development and you know you take Tyree Zomitoy who was in and around you know Norwich's sort of first team around Christmas time when there was a few injuries to the striking areas they felt he'd probably outgrown development football um but didn't really work for him that loan at Swindon. You know, that was a, a team struggling at the wrong end of League One. Um, probably couldn't take a gamble on him by exposing him too too much. Too much. He didn't play a lot of minutes. So he comes back to Norwich this summer and, and that loan probably hasn't really worked for him. But that is the gamble. You know, you're trying to place these players in environments where they can kick on again and come back. And the one who's just popped straight into my head, you know, Ben Godfrey. That, that wasn't a bad loan at, at Shrewsbury, was it? That one year he had, albeit in a slightly different position to where Daniel saw him. But, you know, he came back a lot closer to the first team. And, and look what he's gone on to do now, both for country and club. So um, that's that's what it's about. It's almost the, the mid to longer term harvesting of these players. And, and one thing is for sure, Rhys McAleer will not be the last Norwich loanee going out of the club this summer. There's going to be quite a few of them. Um, Everybody from you know Sam McCallum and Sinani to, for me maybe Soto, um, even the younger ones, and maybe one or two of the senior ones. You know we you know we're looking at what they do inward, uh, and I'm sure we'll get into that in due course this afternoon. But you know if they bring in players that they want in the certain areas of the squad they want, then there's question marks for me against Hernandez, Boheta, Hugo, those type of players, Steeperman maybe. Um, so really, really, really. Interesting aspect to Norwich's summer transfer window, I think, who goes out and who stays. Absolutely. Loads still to happen. I think as of today, it's 74 days remaining of the transfer window. So there is still plenty of time. And um, those of you who read my piece on uh, on Pinker.com and in the papers today and stuff, looking at why it's been a slow transfer market, obviously we've got the Euros going on, the Copper America as well. Only six Premier League clubs have made any signings at all yet. Um, Watford, for instance, have brought in Danny Rose um, on free transfer and also Ashley Fletcher from Middlesbrough, which is I thought was a bit of an odd one, considering he's not really done a, a lot for Borough as a striker and always, always seems to have a fairly dodgy injury record. But uh, Wolves signed a player from Colombia for four million yesterday. So other than Liverpool um, spending, uh, I think it was 36 million on Canate from Red Bull Leipzig, we're really yet to see things get going. So I guess people are a little bit anxious um, as to things not really getting underway. But uh, since we did the last window watch last Friday, I, I guess as a good starting point, Pad, before we dive into the to the questions, is just a quick summary of where we're at with things, really, because we're in, we're in a bit of a holding pattern, sort of Riangus Gunn and, and, and Tyler Cl um, uh, Clark, sorry, isn't it? Well, only in the sense with Angus, I think he's still away. Um, but by all accounts, as we sit here today, um, 
by this time next week, he will be a Norwich player and it will be confirmed uh, early part of next week. Was the last I heard in terms of the formalities. He has to obviously come to, to Colney, to, to Norwich, to Norfolk and complete his medical and, and so on and uh, sign, obviously, the relevant documentation. So, uh, barring an 11th hour or, or a 23.59, should I say, hitch, he will be a Norwich player and that will be the first senior signing of the summer. Uh, the Peter Rallad is done. Um I should just say, Pad, I got his name wrong there. It's Flynn Clark, not Tyler Yeah, Clark. correct. Correct, yeah. DF. Um, he is done, but I think the feeling inside the club was obviously post Emi Buendia's departure. They didn't really want to be rolling out uh, with the greatest respect to this lad. We're talking a lot of there about Reese McAleer and younger players. He's not a player who's going to be threatening Daniel's first team plans this coming season. So I, I think the messaging, they didn't really want that to be the first signing of the summer in terms of the public the perception of, of all that post Emi Buendia. So it will be Angus Gunn. Uh, this lad, the lads in the building. There's a, a link to an Exeter wide player earlier today, 21 year old. If there was to be anything in that direction, that again would be one for the future. He's not going to be threatening Daniel's first team plans uh, next season. And ultimately, I'll go back to the piece you've referenced, and it's there for anybody to want to look on pinkham.com. 20 clubs in the Premier League. Watford aside, the other 19 have done three, four deals, as it is now with Wolves doing that one yesterday. That's four deals across 19 clubs. Anybody who's getting a bit panicky about Norwich's lack of business just needs to take a step back, take a deep breath, and look at what is happening across the entire Premier League. There isn't business happening right here, right now, in terms of a torrent um, and the reasons for that. We all know, you know, the Euros is on. Uh, players and representatives are still, this is their downtime. You know, things are starting to happen. You can see that. You can see the... For me, it's it's sort of a correlation with the amount of speculation and the rumours. They're starting to pick up now as well. The last few days, I felt there's a lot more players getting touted with uh, des different destinations, and that's going to accelerate now as we get into through the Euros, back end of the Euros, back into pre-season, and then building up to the Premier League season. So anybody who's fearing that Norwich are, are slow off the mark, well, the data across the entire Premier League will tell you that isn't the case. I think... Pertinently, two seasons ago, before they were this at this stage going into the Premier League season, before I think I'm right in saying they'd only done Patrick Roberts. The reality is, I know they've both been in the building for quite a considerable amount of time, but Ben Gibson and Demetrius Yanoulis are two new signings who will be unveiled officially as Norwich players at the start of July. So you can say that's semantics, but ultimately, that is two new signings. Angus Gunn will be a third. I think that's, that's a pretty healthy rate of uh, progression at this stage of the summer. So I don't think there's any Norwich fan needs to be concerned. That if, if they feel Stuart Webber is not on the ball, then they haven't been observing him very closely in the last two or three years, have they? Yeah. Uh, shiny new things. That's what people like in transfer windows, isn't it? And <laughs> Gibson and your new list. No, they're, they're old news. We want we want new faces. And that's, that's just how it works for some people, isn't it? But yeah, they, they cannot be overlooked. And also... The fact that that's a significant outlay on those boys, you're talking 8 million on Gibson, 6 million on Yanulis in that, that sort of a region. So Norwich committed to a fair bit of money there. And I think most people agree that those both of those players look like pretty uh, good bits of scouting um, overall. Right. One, uh, one other thing before we dive into the questions, actually, Pad, one link which emerged over the weekend was Philip Billing, wasn't it, at Bournemouth, the, the midfielder. Um, as far as we understand it, he is a player that Norwich like. And I'm sort of framing this in my head as, as similar to the Adam Armstrong deal in that he's a player they like. He's a top championship performer. If it ends up being in the uh, financial realms that they can deal with, i.e. not sort of 20 odd million or 15 plus million, probably, um, then he's one that they'd be quite keen to do business on. What, what do you make of Philip Billing? Because he, he doesn't seem to be um, when I put that um, story out on Saturday, um, it certainly wasn't greeted with sort of universal approval, but there was plenty of people who thought it was a good idea. Yeah, I mean, it, well, ultimately, it's an area of the pitch where we know Norwich are going to be active. They, they yeah. want two, and, and that might not include Oli Skip if, if they can get him in again. So um, it fits it fits the area of the recruitment that they've prioritised, that's for sure. The link with Stuart Webber goes back to their Huddersfield days, so you can understand why, why that that link is there um, and ultimately for me it's a bit of realism Nor Norwich are going to be looking for players of a certain calibre at a certain figure that aren't going to be ready-made Premier League commodities because that's not the market they're in you know I mean look at we don't want to keep labouring the point but if Aston Villa can throw 30 plus million at Emi Buendia um, that's just you know Arsenal getting linked with 40 million bids for Ben, ben White the Brighton centre-back 
Norwich, it's a different stratosphere, completely, completely different stratosphere. Same Premier League, yes, but um, ultimately, Norwich, we're going to have to target players of a Philip Milling kind of financial and footballing standard. And and it looks a decent prospect to me. But, uh, you know, as Daniel said himself, didn't he, again at the end of the season, their strategy un- inevitably in- entails a lot of risk to it because they can't go and buy a £30 million player. That would be the budget completely gone on one player. So um, you're right. If, it, if if any player, whether it's Billing, whether it's Armstrong, if we're getting up to the realms of £20 million, forget it. Forget it simply because it's financially not viable. It is not going to happen with Norwich City this summer. Um, even selling Emi Buendia, it's a non-starter. So, you know, there has to be a degree of realism with some of these players are getting linked with. And, you know, even moving it on to the Adam Armstrong thing, £8 million, I saw a report earlier in, in the week. Well, I don't, I don't know... I don't know where you're getting eight million from for a player who scored as many goals as he did last season. I know he's only got twelve months left, but um, you know I've seen West Ham, I've seen Southampton linked to him as well as Norwich. And if there's any grain of truth in those other clubs, then he is not leaving Blackburn for eight million. Uh, I think Alan Nixon, a very wise old sage uh, journalist in the Northwest, <laughs> he says Blackburn are looking for twenty-five, and and. I, and you might say, well, that's a bit too high for a lad with 12 months left on his contract, if that is his contractual status. But I'd certainly pitch, if he does go this summer, it'll be a lot closer to 25 million and eight. And if there is, so, I mean, for example, West, if West Ham want Adam Armstrong, then Norwich can forget it. They'll move on because they won't be able to compete with West Ham financially. No no two ways about it. Yeah. Um, he is a player they like. There's no doubt about it. But again, I think it's one of those that, that maybe where they thought they could, if it is an Adam Armstrong, uh, maybe pounce a little bit early and then use the sort of the, the championship knowledge of that guy and maybe steal a march almost on some of, some of the bigger fish if, if that isn't going to be the case and that other clubs far more established Premier League clubs in Norwich at the moment are, are aware of Adam Armstrong and willing to bring him in then I'm afraid that that page will be getting turned very quickly because that's ultimately Norwich, Norwich almost have to catch teams out a little bit in terms of their recruitment and get in and get out quicker than teams who maybe aren't fully aware and that obviously comes down to the the recruitment the, the scouting element of the recruitment and and being very proactive and you know Ben Gibson I remember him talking about how he was blown away by that first meeting he had with Daniel and, and Stuart this time last summer um you know there was other interested clubs he went into a meeting he came out of that meeting Norwich was the only place for him because the level of research they'd done on him then even down to the degrees of the charity work he did in the local Middlesbrough area, you know, that they knew all about his injury record, which surgeons had operated on him. Those forensic elements that aren't about pounds, shillings and pence, but they show a interested party. We really want you. And this is how far down the path we've gone to try and convince you to come in. Norwich have to be better than other clubs in those areas of when it comes to player trading, because if it's simply about who's got the, the deepest pockets and the heaviest wallet, Norwich are going to miss out this summer. So, yeah, right here, right now, I find it hard to think Adam Armstrong would become a Norwich player just because of, you know, if he's going to be getting touted with a West Ham or a Southampton, it's very hard to see how Norwich can convince him to come here um, over those type of clubs. Because ultimately what Norwich are also fighting is is the perception that 12 months later, 12 months from now, they're back in the championship and there's no player really um, is probably going to want to take that level of gamble if you've got a West Ham or a Southampton. Keep using those clubs because they're the ones who've been linked to Adam Armstrong. But uh, time will tell. I mean, ultimately, Norwich are very keen, you know, to bring in quality, not quantity. To do that, they're going to have to spend a certain amount of money, far beyond what they've done under Stuart Webber and Daniel Farkin for, and probably beyond their transfer record, which is sort of 12, 30 million, Robbie Brady level proportions. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not creating the you know the impression that they're going to have to go into the bargain basement but in premier league terms it probably is going to be a bit bargain basement because they simply can't compete with the astronomical figures that these other clubs even in a pandemic market seemingly are looking to spend you know it's uh, it, again it's going to be about creativity and risk that's essentially what norwich's recruitment is this summer yeah it is yeah and um armstrong is a strange one as well in that Blackburn seem to have got themselves into a bit of a hole over the sell-on fee with Newcastle. Apparently, it's 40%. Yeah, I mean, exactly. that's just um, 
a strange situation for them to have got into, you know, let him to get down to the tw- last 12 months. I know they briefly flirted with the playoffs this year, but they were never really in with a, with a shout. So we shall see. I, I, there's plenty of people interested in Adam Armstrong. He scored 28 goals in the championship. We all know that. West Ham's an interesting one because Jared Bowen stepped up and, and did well, didn't he, from, from Hull. So we shall see. Right, let's get into the Twitter questions. Um, I've got a few here. Uh, Jake NTFC Jake says, "Do you think Norwich will spend over forty million this summer?" No. Uh, yeah, unlikely, and unless yeah. they would sell Aaron's and Campwell as Aaron's and Campwell as well, um, very unlikely. I'll put this one to you, Pad. Freddie Gavita, do you think we'll get any fees for the four outcast players, or will it be similar to the Heiser deal? So we're talking Leitner, Dermich, Closer, and Tribal. No. Absolutely no chance. No, all all that will be is getting him off the wage bill, as it was with Heiser. I think there are a few clauses in the Heiser if he was to go on and do well at Karlsruhe. Um, so they'll protect themselves in that regard. But uh, no, with the greatest respect to that quartet, I mean, maybe <laughs> maybe, maybe Dermot. I mean. oh, you're right. <laughs> maybe um, maybe maybe Yodge Dermot, but then they brought him in on a free. So in that regard, um, if it's if it if it's if that's a deal breaker. To, to getting him out the door or keeping him here, then then it's not going to happen. So, no, I think uh, closer. No, can't see it. Um, Leitner and Tribal. No, I think I think that operation this summer is get him off the wage bill and uh, wish him all the best. You know, just again a bit like uh, to a slightly different degree in terms of the young players who aren't really going to be part of it. They're not going to be part of it. The, the wheel has turned for for that four now. Um, the club have moved on, and, and it's time for them players to move on as well. Yeah, Dermich did score some goals for Rijeka. He's on standby for Switzerland, wasn't he, for the Euro? So there's a, there's a chance that he, there might be a bit of a fee. But yeah, as you say, it's all about the wages. Um, CB uh, on Twitter says, will the under-23s get some serious investment for new players this summer? Is this actually more important to get right for a self-sustained club than big money first teamers? Um, I'm not sure about serious investment. I think Norwich have a pretty steady investment. You hinted at this earlier, really, Pad, didn't you, when we were um, discussing the uh, the lad that was linked this morning, Joel Randall from, from Exeter. Um, you look at Rhys McAleer, for instance, who's gone out on loan uh, just a couple of days ago. He's one, when they brought him in from Motherwell, that was apparently 250000 with add-ons and a sell on him, et cetera. Uh, Leicester and West Ham had been linked with him at the time. So um, you know, Akin Famuo, similar-ish sort of money, I think, when they uh, brought him in from Luton. And, and if you... Reed and Riley, know, Dave, as well, the guy who brought him in January from Bolton. Yeah. Fielder, yeah, similar. Most of them did. I mean, Ben Godfrey was only 150,000 initially, wasn't he? I think it ended up being about a million after he was successful and stuff. But that's the thing with that it's a big turnover, and why you always have to sort of take academy stuff with a pinch of salt, don't you? That not every player makes it, as you were discussing earlier, Pad. Some will get into the first team, some won't make it at all. Some will go out on loan and they might be able to make a bit of money on, but you do have to speculate a little bit. But I, I don't see that being a a priority to chuck millions at the at the academy because um, that's not quite where Norwich are. A bit like at first team level, they have quite a specific market that they're aiming at. Um, they they don't they can't just spend five. Uh, the player that uh, I no no I didn't mention yet that West Ham have signed this week. I can't remember his name, but he's from Chelsea. And they spent four and a half million on him. He's barely made any appearances at senior level and doesn't seem to be one for their immediate first team. Norwich aren't really going to be doing that at the moment. Um, I'll put this one your way, Pad from Sam Thomas. <clears throat> Given the wage structure we have, is it really likely we will bring in any 10 million plus players? Wendy on 80,000 a week sounds like a lot, but can you find his talent in three players worth 11 million each on 25 grand a week? So you can see where they're going. Um, if we were going to spend all of that money, surely we would have kept him. I'm not sure it's quite as straightforward as that, is it? No, 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 no. Um, and ultimately, it would, you know, it, reading between the lines, he probably felt it was time for him to go as well. And, and that flows into what Stuart always says about, you know, the model is about, it's almost a mutual understanding. You know, they they do well by the player, the player does well by them. And then at the mutually agreeable time, if the money's right from an interested party, in the view of Stuart Webber particularly, then uh, the club will cash in. And that's what's happened uh, um, so I don't think I don't think they've kicked Emmy Buendia out the door. Let's put it that way. I think he was very very keen that this was the summer he was going to be leaving the football club, uh, and then it's about trying to get the best deal. If you're Norwich, protecting what you feel is the best deal within, because you know I do accept that 
people are looking at a deal that's maybe structured around lower end of 30 million scale and feel that's shortchanging a little bit. But ultimately, and this flows into what we've discussed so far on, on here this afternoon, that in order for Norwich to be able to do what they need to do, they need to generate revenue and revenue very quickly. And and in the context of a, a window that hasn't really got started yet, it's only them or Liverpool who've done, in terms of players trading in or out, done anything that remotely looks like a Premier League scale deal, you know, 30 plus million. What I'm talking about, Canate for Liverpool and obviously Villa taking Emi Buendia. Um, and that, I think, doing that so quickly will aid what Norwich now want to do over the next sort of weeks, month or so, because ultimately they could have they could have rebuffed Villa and sat tight and waited and hoped, you know, to drive that price up a little bit more towards the back end of the window. But then if that then precludes them from doing what they want to do and he still goes a week or two from the end of the window, then what good is having all that money sat in the bank if they start the season and they haven't reinforced and replaced Buendia? So on that aspect, no, I think it wasn't a case that they could have kept Demi. I think ultimately it was always going to be the case. He was leaving this summer. Uh, and then in terms of replacing him, well, we've already said it, you know, creativity and risk. And that will basically mean bringing in, whether we're talking about attacking players, bringing in those scale of players that A, they can afford budget wise. And that's obviously as the question is right to point out, it's not just the transfer fees, the salaries as well. Um, and I would imagine I'd stick my neck out and say Norwich is, salary base in the Premier League will be considerably the lowest of the other 20 clubs. So that's that's the realism, that's the reality of the situation. And uh, they won't be able to offer an Emi Buendia replacement the, the same money he's getting at Aston Villa. Nowhere near it. Um, probably probably only a third if we, if we if that is the figure that's been banded about 80,000 a week. I think, um, yeah, that's, that's complete. As I say, you know they're in the Premier League, but they're not when it comes to the transfer aspect of this. They're they're in a completely different stratosphere to the majority of the clubs. Um, can't think of any clubs really who you know Burnley maybe could they compete yeah. with them, but probably not because Burnley have had sustained access to Premier League broadcast revenue. Norwich haven't had that, so I really can't. The think... now, haven't they? They've got Americans in during the last season, yeah. but I think Burnley initially sort of did it in a way Norwich are doing at the moment, didn't they? Exactly, exactly, and that, that's and that's what we have to bear in mind. So, you know, I think the reality is we know Stuart Webber is a bit of an alchemist. Him, him, him and Kieran Scott, <laughs> yes, they've, had, they've had one or two misses, but you know, Pookie, Cruel, Wendy, just those three for starters. But I don't think we can expect him to go out and find a ready-made Emi Buendia. And let's be honest, Emi Buendia isn't proven in the Premier League. You know, the, the, the season he had, um, good few assists, but his goal count was poor for, for, for the level of player that we think he can go on to be. So Villa are buying potential. Yes, he's coming off the back of an unbelievable season in, in the Championship. And I think we'd have all have felt if he'd have stayed in the green and yellow shirt, those numbers would have been considerably higher this time around in the Premier League because he knows what it's all about now. And he's two years wiser and a bit more mature and his game is rounded a bit more. But it is still an element of gamble from Aston Villa, that sort of deal, that scale of deal for me, the finances involved. Um, and it, that's where Norwich are, that, that ultimately whoever they bring in in those attacking player positions now, they're not going to be ready-made, off-the-shelf, ready-to-go, proven Premier League performers. They're going to be players with potential who, with the right coaching under Daniel, um, and who fit the template of how Daniel wants to go about it in terms of his tactical aspect of it, who they feel can kick on. I mean, you only have to look at, you know, we've seen him. He was excellent for Slovakia the other day. You're talking about the Euros, Dave. You know, Andre Duda. He looked yeah. a completely different player to the lad who was wandering about a little bit, not sure what on earth was going on in those months when they brought him in on loan the previous Premier League season. Yet, there's no doubt that that is a player of some ability in an attacking midfield number 10 position. Um, and he showed that the other day. I thought at a very good, you know, a very good level, the European Championship. So, you know, ultimately, recruitment they can be as try and be as precise as they can, but there will be an element of gamble to this. And we just, you just have to hope if you're an Orange fan that who they do target, they get more right than they do wrong, and certainly more right than they did two summers ago when okay, they didn't have the finances to try and do the business they want to do this summer, but as Stuart Weber famously said afterwards, you know, they, they basically didn't give Daniel the firepower he needed, did they? They got it badly wrong, didn't give him the support they needed. Um, I don't think they will do that again this summer, but how successful? Well, nobody knows, and that's the beauty of it. You know, th this is a bit of a 
open book at the minute, right here, right now, at the start of the summer. Um, but I just go back to what Stuart said to us at the end of this season, just gone, judge them when that window closes, look at the squad they've got then, compare it with the squad they had at the end of this past season. If the squad is better and the 11 is better, then they've done their job, haven't they? And then it's over to Daniel to try and extract the maximum from that squad. But, you know, I think we just, ultimately, we just uh, if you're an Irish fan, you just got to be, sad, sad as it is to say, quite realistic and maybe a little bit pessimistic in the sense of, you know, the recruitment they do do. Yes, they will endeavour to bring in that quality, but, you know, you're a 20th wage budget club in a Premier League that, you know, you're by some distance, the smallest financial operation in it. So, you know, that's what it is. And they're going to, what they'll hope to do is make up for what they lack in financial power in other areas, whether it's good coaching or whether it's the togetherness of the group of players, whether it's those marginal games off the pitch, hopefully getting fans back in the car road and what they can bring, you know, in terms of atmospheres, you go back to that Man City epic. Um, and ultimately that those constituent parts add up to enough to keep them, above 17th for this first season and then kick on from there but you know I, I think anybody anybody who's hoping that they've got 30 plus million in the bank now from maybe Buendia sale and they're now going to suddenly start throwing 20 million pounds at players not going to happen yeah and as most people I think are aware by this point you don't just get 100 million up front either of course they don't just write you that 97 million pound check or whatever and the 170, 180 million figure that gets bounced around, that is including parachute payments, isn't it? Three years of parachute payments, which if Norwich goes straight back down, they don't even get, you only get two as well. So it's complex. And um, uh, well, a lot of clubs like a Villa who have got exceptionally wealthy owners, they just don't have to worry about it, do they? They either borrow the money or they tap up the owner to, to fill those little holes. And that's what Norwich can't do. And, you know, we seen Ben Kensel leave this week and, whatever the perceived uh, sort of reputation and, and the unpopularity of some things he did and, and popularity of a lot of things he did as well. Guys like Ben Kensel and the financial guys at Cow Road have a tough job, don't they? They're, they're trying to get blood from a stone effectively a lot of the time and trying to maximise as much as they can to, you know, build up that transfer budget as much as is possible for a club like Norwich. That is the self-funded model. So it is, I, I quite like it in a way that, I think it's a bit different and as a reporter, certainly that you're covering a club who are doing things that little bit differently and um, are, are trying to crack the Premier League nut in a, in a different way to the rest of the other clubs. And the big thing always is if they can do it just once or twice, stay up at that level, the whole game changes and then they can start to think about spending consistently bigger fees like Burnley did and get established. But Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Um, the final question from Twitter. It's good you mentioned Duda, actually, Pad, because that flows into this one. Uh, Charlie says, do you think it's likely we'll sign the majority of our players from overseas sides or use what's available to buy two or three championship players due to the cost? It seems like 30 million could be four or five players from Germany, but only two or three from England. Um, I think the big impact on that is the changes to the work permit rules uh, once Brexit's officially happened at the start of the year I think now to get a work permit for someone they pretty much have got to be playing either in a top flight or in European competition for a club that plays at that sort of a level or they've got to be um, playing and starting regularly for a club uh, for a nation sorry in FIFA's top 50 so Finland for instance are just outside the top 50 so Puki wouldn't have been able to come to Norwich in 2018 as he did so I think that has probably been levelled out a little bit and, and the players that Norwich have got to target because they are um, established players who can get a work permit probably is going to put them in a similar bracket finance-wise to your top EFL players. But um, that's that's an evolving thing really, isn't it, Pad? I mean, we don't know how the work permit rules will, will evolve. Um, that, that's something that it sounds like not all clubs really have got got to grips with yet either but certainly from from what we've heard from the club that Norwich straight away were hot on the work permit in the um what's it called the GBE the government body endorsement which is what you need to get from the FA you have to qualify for this certain amount of points Norwich has switched on to it aren't they Demetrius Yanoulis that's that's all you need to know about that Dave yeah I mean they were bearing in mind that was the first window when those regulations started to take actual effect um you know they they were very proactive, and again, Stuart talked about how certainly referenced certain individuals in the club, the secretarial and almost administrative, and the, and the legal teams 
they were like almost learning as they went uh, 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 in terms of that Yanulis deal. And he was right on the cut line. I think he was right on 15 points. So he only just qualified um, for the necessary paperwork to get him over here. But having gone through that process, and that was the point Stuart made, this coming summer now, they probably are ahead of the vast majority of English clubs. And that goes back to what I just said before about financially, maybe, you know, you line Norwich up in a head v head against any of the other 19 clubs in the Premier League, forget it. But if it's aspects of, well, we can target player X in that league, and but we know because we've been through this course and distance with Dimitris Yanoulis' deal that we could bring him in. Um, and other clubs are still scrambling around and just trying to get to the bottom of what in, in terms of the red tape element of this, then Norwich steal a march, don't they? And then, you know, then you can, because, you know, to be honest, 6.2 million for Yanoulis uh, for a permanent deal for a fully fledged Greek international who'd been playing at a top level club in Greece in European competition. Well, that's, that's by anybody's measure, very, very good business. It remains to be seen if he can step up and, and look, a, look a decent player in the Premier League. He certainly seems to have the, the attributes to, to, to shine in the Premier League in terms of you look at his game and, and how well it is suited to, to how Daniel wants to play. Um, and so, you know, this time next season, let's be positive, this time next summer, Dimitris Yanoulis, we might be viewing him as, uh, you know, two, three times the value of that figure because he's proven himself. So there's the risk, there's the risk and there's the creativity measured in one player. So for him, that's exactly what they'll be looking to do uh, this time around, I think. And I mean, you say there that is there a counterbalance between domestic and I still think they're going to tip more towards the overseas because I think there's more value in the overseas market uh, within the context of obviously you're yeah, right. There's no point in targeting players who they know they won't get through the red tape aspect. So, but they'll know that that'll have been factored in and to their to their recruitment strategy. So, um, I mean, the, the lad earlier in the week, the Celta Vigo attacking field of Bryce Mendes. I don't think right here right now there's anything firm to that, but he's clearly a player who they will be well aware of because they've obviously looked at the Spanish leagues, you know, Buendia obviously, but since then. Xavi Quintilla, they went went back to Spain, plucked him from Villarreal. So he is a player they will know all about. And, and you look at him and, and his talk that, you know, nine, 10 million pounds is, is the sort of value attached to him. And he was training with the Spanish squad prior to the Euro. So had excellent numbers in La Liga for a team who finished in the top eight. So again, just that, maybe not top tier, maybe not even the tier below, but players in decent leagues who come into their price bracket, who could fit potentially the type of player Daniel's looking for. That's the type of recruitment I think we'll, we'll see from Norwich this summer. Yeah, and those um, rules and the points they have to accumulate, they're very harsh. Literally, if a nation, if you're looking at the international caps, if a nation's outside the top 50, that's just it. They don't, they get hardly any credit for it at all, which is which is a bit strange, to be honest. Another name from Spain that we've seen um, in recent months, well, it's come up again, actually, isn't it? It's Adrian Imbaba at Espanyol. He was linked during the transfer window of the last Premier League season. So, of course, they're going to be looking at all, all those leagues. They've got to find, as as we said earlier, they're looking for sort of their own little uh, niche almost, aren't they? Players who maybe have got 12 months left on their contract or just something that weighs in their favour. Um, anyway, here's one that I've been wanting to ask for a little while, Pad, on Madison, because you did a story on this um, today, didn't you? Charlie Summers on YouTube says, Afternoon, chaps. Few rumours about Madison going around. Any idea on a sell-on percentage we have, if any? Which I believe you can give us a pretty good answer on. Yes, and it's fifteen percent. So um, you know you could do you can do the math, as the Americans might say. Uh, you know if they paid originally sort of low end twenty million. Um, obviously there was clauses aside from the sell-on, but apart from I think Leicester got into the Europa League two seasons ago, got into it this time around. But there was a payout on that aspect. But in terms of the England side and Champions League, not as yet, sadly. Um, but there is definitely that that type of sell on. So uh, normally it's on the profit of these things. So you know he's getting touted with fifty million pound departures, thirty million pound, fifteen percent of that. Yes, please. You know that would, as it was pointed out to me the other day, that would comfortably fill any hole left by the BK8 sponsorship deal this summer, wouldn't it? So yeah. all contributions gratefully received. And and again, you know, back to what to start this discussion and about is there any concern that the sort of lack of business and, you know, are we getting, you know, a bit concerned that Stuart and his team are, you know, not quite all over this. Just look at the, the deals that he's done. Those big, huge deals for, for him, for Godfrey, the way they've structured them. If those players go on and fulfil their potential and they've made excellent starts to their respective next stages of their careers, then there could be some residual dividends coming to Norwich. Um, and that's, again, part of the model. It's, 
placing these clubs. Buendia, you know, Buendia goes and has an unbelievable season. He won't be at Aston Villa too long, let, let's be honest. You know, he will then go into the elite bracket and he'll be going for considerably more than 30 plus million. And if that is the case, again, Norwich will get a payout from that. So, um, yes, is the simple and short answer. James Madison leaves this summer for whoever, for that sort of scale of figure, then you're probably talking anywhere between maybe three, five, six million hitting Norwich's bank account, which will be very gratefully received, I'm sure. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Nick Deal says, feels strange to me that Weber would have signed off on the Buendia deal without a replacement ready to go. He talked about a Premier League tax before. Now we have a Buendia tax on top of that, which is quite a uh, quite a good take on it. And um, this is something me and Connor discussed a bit last week, Pad, so, um, or the other week. So I'm interested to get your sort of take on it, but a couple of questions. We had a few on um, Bryce Mendes as well, but you've already spoken about him, the link to the Celta Vigo uh, player this week. Uh, Ed Ivan says, will Kieran Dow take Emmy's place in the team next season? And where was the other one on the similar vibe? Steve Chick, afternoon, gents. Any news slash rumours on a creative midfielder to replace Wendia? So I, I've written a piece on this and spoken about it before, but where, where do you sort of see Kieran Dowell and I suppose Campwell in this whole scheme of Wendy's exit? They obviously have it puts added importance on them. But we saw Dow play very well on the right at Forest, didn't we, the night that Buendia was was unavailable. Um, do you think there's any chance that we end up seeing Dow as being the starting right winger and, and and almost maybe not permanently, but even in the sort of start of the season, he could be somebody who steps in to Emmy's role quite quickly and is able to get up to speed there as, as a sort of, sort of ready-made replacement? Yeah, that's an interesting one. And ultimately, we can't really answer that until we... You know, we get to the start of the season and we see what they've... Because ultimately, it will hinge on who they bring in. They're clearly going to look to bring in uh, somebody to, to do a similar type of role to, to Emmy. They're all, they're pri even prior to Emmy's departure, they were looking for a, another wide player who can operate down down the middle. So, potentially, we're talking here about Cantwell, Dow, and two other new, as yet, arrivals into that mix. So, um, I, could, I could see him operating down the right, but irrespective of whether it's down the right or down the middle, I think he, he as if you put him alongside Cantwell, for me, Cantwell has shown already that he can operate in a Premier League, that the Premier League suits him. You know, that the start he had to that season, uh, two seasons ago, um, the goals, the assists, he just looked at home and comfortable in that environment. We can't say the same about Kieran Dale yet because, you know, very limited opportunity with Everton in Premier League level. Um, I think it was only one or two games. One of those was his debut yeah. against Norwich, I recall. But, so that, for me, is the big question mark. It's not necessarily where you would play him across that front three behind Timu. It's can you play him at that level and can he look comfortable and can he look like he's able to make a difference? Sadly, that wasn't the case for Marco Stieperman. He stepped up and it, it didn't really work for him in the Premier League. He didn't. He, he looked like a player. It was a bit, he was a bit out of sync with the Premier League and, and demands, hence why they went and brought in Andre Duda midway through that season. Um, so I, I'm more interested, really, in terms of Kieran Dowell, it's just to see, can he step up and early on look like he's comfortable at that level and whether it's down the middle or down the right-hand side. What we do know, clearly, and we, we saw ample evidence of, evidence of that towards the end of last season, what a talent he is. You know, technically, he shouldn't have any issues at all adapting to the Premier League. You know, some of his awareness, his, his ability on the ball at free kick against Derby, phenomenal technique. Um, that There is a player there who, who, to me, should be Premier League grade, but we need to see that. And if... If let's look positive, let's, let's look positive. If he if he, he starts a few games in August and he starts to show that, which we saw at the end of the championship season, then he could save Daniel and Stewart quite a few headaches because what they'll be hoping is that he does step up. Because if he doesn't, you've probably got another issue in terms of that front four, really, um, including Timu, because you know, that's where they fell down. You know, there was one or two other areas, of course, in the Premier League two seasons ago. But after that initial bright start faded, they they just didn't look like they had enough guile or nous about them at the top end of the pitch. You know, once this sort of initial allure of, oh, we're in the Premier League now, isn't this fun? Isn't this exciting? Once that wore off, um, it was it was a pretty painful slog at the top end of the pitch in terms of the creativity and the goals and the assists. So uh, massive aspect of them getting it right again if they want to avoid what happened two seasons ago. So, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd certainly give him a go at the start of the season, whether it was down the right, down the middle. I mean, they're so interchangeable, those three areas behind team, yeah. aren't they? Let's be honest. Even Campbell. Campbell's not an out-and-out -out wide player. He's 
propensity is to cut inside and, and, and play through the middle and then get the wide players, Giannoulis and Aaron's Aaron's, if we still here on the right-hand side, offering the width. So I think that Dowell is certainly interchangeable enough to play in that front three, middle or right-hand side of. Um, but for me, the bigger issue with him is can he grasp it? Can he show us what Cantwell did at the start of the two seasons ago and, and show that he can impact games at the Premier League level? Max has got a double barrel surname now, isn't he? Everyone ends up going Aaron's Aaron's. <laughs> I do anyway, yeah. A well, third name. Um, but yeah, I'm really interested to see how Dow gets on as well because I, I, I agree. I think there is a... Uh, a good chance that we're going to see that similarity to how Campwell just seemed to suit the rhythm of the Premier League better than the uh, rough and tumble of the championship. Uh, of the championship, um, William Catchpole on YouTube says anything on Skip since all the Tottenham manager controversies. I mean, no, that's not moved on at all. I think you, you never know. Gattuso, they seem to have uh, decided not to go down that route, which was a bit of a surprise to everyone anyway. But he was very much a defensive midfielder, wasn't he? So he might have been. Uh, a big Ollie Skip fan. So them moving their interest from that might end up. But as we've expected since the end of last season, the Ollie Skip thing is going to rumble on quite possibly until deadline day. We will just have to see how things turn out at Spurs. Uh, Jack Fitzgibbon asks, will Melvin City stay? I mean, he, with the way Norwich's central midfield is at the moment, literally in terms of numbers, they may well need him in defensive, mid uh, defensive midfield in pre-season because there's only Jacob Sorensen there at the moment, isn't there? And, you know, that's what he was sort of brought in. It was maybe thought that he could be one of those players they were thinking could be a long-term successor to Alex Tete. Uh, still a young guy. I think he's only 20, 21, but his loan at Beveren just didn't go well at all. He got an injury right at the start of the season and then didn't get any chances at all. So he would have to have a heck of a pre-season to be uh, a legitimate consider consideration ahead of the Premier League this season. Uh, I'll put this one to you, Pad. Um, following on a little bit from what you were saying there, really, but Craig Brown on Facebook, why not send Ida out on loan if Fuck has no intention of giving him games? He needs games now. His talent is wasted sitting on the bench most of the season. Well, from what we hear, they do want to give him games, don't they? Oh, there's no doubt. They, they really feel, again, like we said with Dal, you look at a player... You feel can they operate in the Premier League? Um, Dal, yes. Ida, very much, yes. Very bullish um, towards the end of last season and the start of the summer. You speak to anybody at the club who's in these positions where they're making those type of decisions, and no, there's no way he's going out. He's um, he's very much part of the plans. And you know, if we talk about the strikers, you have to continue. I mean, we saw you know a pretty dejected looking Timu Puki on the bench when he came off the other day. He's not fit. Clearly, he's not fit playing for Finland. Um, and my concern now is is not Finland and their progress in the Euros. It's what the impact and the knock-on effect is for Norwich. Because, you know, if he literally, figuratively, limps back to, to Norwich over the summer, is he going to be fit and firing as he needs to be? He needs to be at his absolute best for Norwich to hit the ground running, particularly with the fixture list as it is now. Um, and, and my concern is that he's not going to be in that state. And if he isn't, They'll already have to be thinking about alternatives, whether that's internally, and if it is, either I think it's probably the next cab off the rank, or you know the Armstrong talk would tell you that you know maybe they've started to consider because certainly at the start of the summer, the vibe very much was no, we don't need an out and out striker to bring in. We, we're going to rely on what we've got already in the building and then supplement it with like a Josh King type player who can maybe dual wide player and down the middle. Maybe there's an acceptance now with part of that equation being Timu's fitness and that they might need to go out and bring an out and out striker in. And I think with Timu, I had a look the other day, you know, his contractual status, because as, again, I've seen talk of the Turkish football clubs looking at him again this summer, rightly or wrongly. Mm. I think he's entering now the final 12 months. There is an option similar to Cantwell, but, you know, in the, in the mid to long term way that they obviously plan strategically, you know, you might need to start already now thinking about not so much this coming season, but what does the following season look like in terms of who's leading Norwich's front line. And with the greatest respect to him, he's not getting any younger. Um, he's got a hell of a lot of miles on the clock. And um, and I think those that's clearly increasingly going to be an aspect they're going to have to look at. And if that is the case, and they're thinking not only shorter term, but mid to longer term, well, let's see. Let's see Adam Ida. What's he got? You know, we've, we've, we've seen glimpses of his ability, um, not so much in the Premier League, really, uh, but he was so raw two years ago. I, I don't think we'd place any store by what we saw in those cameos against Man United and one or two other games. And really his championship season was wrecked sadly by by injury and 
you know, he was di- one of the players who was diagnosed with coronavirus as well. So it was very stop start. But there's there's still a rock solid belief inside that camp that he can be an, an influential player at Premier League level. Obviously, initially, probably as an understudy to Timu, but who knows as the season develops, he gets into the side, scores a few goals, confidence, young player, could catch fire, couldn't he? So mm. no, to answer that question, he won't be going out alone, definitely not. Um but it's a fair point. If it goes the other way, and let's hope Timu is fit and firing himself and is the main man and scoring goals every week. And Adam Ede is not really getting much more than the odd cameo for his for his own development. That's probably not the best thing. And and then you have to start considering maybe it is time to let him go out and play some football because I don't think he's going to kick on if he's uh, you know sat on the bench most weeks in the Premier League. Great to be training and in a Premier League environment day in day out, but ultimately. And you saw it with his compatriot, Omar Bamadeli. Look how he's kicked on just for a 10 or 12 game spell at the end of last season. Now, there's a guy who probably, if he hadn't had any first team action towards the end of the season, you're probably bracketing him with a Reese McAleer with no disrespect to Reese. You know, you're thinking maybe a Scottish Championship level loan for him. Now, depending on what they do in terms of the central defensive areas, I don't think he'll be going anywhere because he's proven that he is actually a viable option. Now, obviously, He's going up a level, so let's not put too much pressure on him. But that's that's the shifting sands that there's there's a player who grabbed his chance in a very short period of time, showed he was probably capable, and uh, and he as a result will probably now be part of Norwich's Premier League plan, certainly in the the early part of the, the season. So no, I don't I don't see Adam going out anywhere in the interim. Um, but you're right, the questioner is spot on for me. It, of all the kind of players who go out on loan, should they not go out on loan? He's the most uh, debatable one because you can see both sides of the argument. I think with the majority of them, you know, we'll take Sam McCallum. I think he needs to go and play games because I don't think he's anywhere near and good enough for Norwich's first team yet. But certainly Adam Eder, if you've got a run of games, you just don't know. He could contribute. And uh, and as a result, if you're Farker and Weber, I think of all the younger players, just sort of below established first team level, probably an Adam Eder is the most difficult one just in terms of what does his career look like, look like the next six to 12 months? Yeah, and we've got to remember these guys are still young, aren't they? I think McCallum and Ida are both still 20. And, you know, Ida's playing for Ireland again this summer and stuff like that. So Craig Brown says Billing would be a great signing, too expensive, I know. Um, Jack was is, is clearly a big Melvin City fan because he'd asked that question about eight times before we got to it. <laughs> um, but he, he's got his answer now. Uh, I've just been trying to keep up with the comments, really, because there's absolutely loads coming through. Game Guide 2502 on YouTube. I've been hearing about us linked to Joel Randall from Exeter. Yeah, we mentioned that a little bit earlier. Uh, you can read that at pinker.com at the moment. He's uh, He had a really good sort of breakthrough season in League Two this year. Eight goals at that level. Uh, Celtic um, and Charlton linked previously peterborough apparently had a bid turned out so we're doing a bit of digging on that one trying to find out how serious norwich's interest is because he sounds like the sort of lad at 21 who the sort of numbers in league two as a winger is going to be getting noticed by sort of championship level maybe lower premier league level clubs as one for the future but again as we said he's not someone that would be coming into norwich's premier league thinking that's the sort of player who if they were to get get him for whatever half a million or something uh even maybe a package worth a million they'd then be looking to loan him out to a better level than league two it's all all a big process isn't it this is an interesting one pad tom chan on youtube says with tete gone do you think there's a chance we'll go for slightly older players to bring experience into the dressing room i, I do i do actually yeah um for that very reason that that you Yes, there will be an element of risk in terms of maybe players who haven't played in the Premier League, but by the same token, maybe, maybe, not, maybe, maybe but, but you look at Gibson and Jordan Hugel, they came in last summer, they're certainly in that bracket, slightly older players, a bit more experience, not huge amounts in the Premier League, granted, but for certainly the Championship level when they were recruiting, that was very much the template. Just experience, but also the characters as well. You know, players who've been around the block a little bit can handle adversity, the, the tougher times, they, they know what it's about, you know, good characters inside the dressing room dynamic, the, the team spirit uh, and that aspect of it as well. So, yeah, I think, I think I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say they're going to abandon what their philosophy is about because ultimately it's primarily developing players and then they either stay at Norwich or they get moved on for considerably more than Norwich paid for them. So that's still very much the, the, the necessity in terms of recruitment, one strand of it. But yeah, I, I think, I think we've seen enough pragmatism from, Daniel and Stewart now 
uh, since they've arrived in various aspects of how they've gone about the jobs, that I wouldn't be wouldn't be beyond the realms to think that there probably would be one or two. I wouldn't say old. I mean, when you say older, I mean I don't think we're going to be in Teddy age. Otherwise, what's the point of it? Teddy, you, know, you might as well keep in. But but maybe maybe mid to later twenties. Yeah, maybe more possibly approaching their peak or just just at the start of their peak years rather than you know somebody who's uh, who's here for a final payday. That that certainly won't be happening now. No, I think there's some good leadership there already, isn't there? And Krill, Gibson, Hanley, Pookie, etc. You got you got a decent uh, group of sort of leaders there, uh, right? I've been trying to catch up with all the comments because we've had absolutely loads. So I'm not going to get through all of them, but there's one that I want to finish on, which I think would be good on Max Aaron's pad. So I'll come to you on that in a minute. Aaron's, Aaron's, Aaron's sorry. <laughs> Chamlam on YouTube says disappointing. Ida didn't get a full season. I was expecting him to shine. Wesley U on YouTube says, such a shame. Duda didn't work out. What a player. Trevor Hill, we must get another de decent central defender in. I think most people agree with that, and I think that is the club's intention as well. Uh, Chumlam again, Buendia is irreplaceable. What we can do is strengthen two positions with the money and hope the team is more prepared for the Prem as a result. Uncle Mort says, Dow cannot match Emmy's defensive work, which is a good point that as much as when Dia's creative numbers get a lot of hype, his defensive numbers were fantastic as well, weren't they? So, um, and just to finish on then, Pad, the question about Max, if I just scroll back up to it, where was it? I can't find it now. Uh, there we go, the box protector. Aaron's was touted as to be gone first. No words on him or rumours. Is he staying? Uh, the last rumour we heard was into Milan, I think, wasn't it? Um, from uh, uh, I'm not sure how serious we were taking that link, but you can kind of say that for Max's situation overall, can't you? Because he's been linked with basically every top club in Europe. So it kind of, it's sort of reached farcical proportions. But given we know that by, uh, sorry, not by me, but Barcelona actually inquired and we went through all that first last, what was it, September. Yeah. Um, you have to give it some sort of... Um, uh, seriousness and and the reports are that it was Roma that had the bid rejected in January etc so it it's not quite as far school as it first seems but just to close on pad yeah w with Max we haven't heard anything new have we and we, we're not really sure on on what the Emmy sale it, it, what sort of impact that will have on the situation well yeah yes and no Dave I mean I'd have seen the last day or two not new because he's been linked to them already but but the United they, they want Trippier Apparently, they've, they've opened yeah. discussions with Atletico. Um, Atletico don't want to let the lad go. He's just won the Spanish title with him. He's got two years left. So, certain outlets, um, Sky being one, have said that if they don't get Trippier, Max Aarons is, is one they would then look at. Um, and, you know, if Manchester United come knocking and are paying Buendia plus type figures, then I think Max Aarons will go. I think he's sadly in the same bracket as Emmy. I think he's probably feels he, he could have gone last summer. He didn't. It was to his eternal credit. He got his head down and, and with all that Barcelona and all the other, Bayern Munich and PSG, I mean, just ridiculous football manager-esque kind of, uh, you know, speculation. And in Barcelona's case, actual, you know, picking up the phone to Stuart Weber didn't one iota alter his performance levels. And he finished the season yeah. again with his reputation enhanced. Um, and he is now, for me, one of the best young English talents in, in, in the game right now. Uh, all that experience he's amassed, you know, 100 plus appearances, senior level, two promotions. Okay, he's had a relegation, but even that in, its sense, in it itself, a full season in the Premier League at his age, there's not many players who've got that on their uh, CV. Regular for England, 21s, played in tournament football for them. No, uh, sadly, I think uh, he will go. Um, and I, I've got a theory, and it's only my theory, I hasten to add, but I, I think the club who've been consistently linked with him is Tottenham. Now, Norwich want Ollie Skip. Tottenham will say want Max Aarons. I think there'll probably be a deal to be done there, potentially working out the figures in terms of the, the differential, because clearly, you know, you would think Max Aarons would cost more than Ollie Skip. I'm not even saying that maybe an Ollie Skip permanent. I'm saying maybe an Ollie Skip loan and then X amount on top and you get Max Aarons. And ultimately, it doesn't really matter who the Tottenham head coach is or isn't at the minute because these deals at that level get put together by the Stuart Webber types at football clubs. You know, Daniel said, I remember Daniel saying when they got Ollie Skip out, 
12 months ago. It wasn't Jose who gave the green light. Um, Jose didn't really have anything to do with it. It was Stuart Webber, his counterpart, who he knows very well, very close relationship um, at Tottenham. They were the ones who put that Ollie Skip deal together. So why can't, you know, in the background that be happening now? I just, th- I just think the way Stuart was so bullish about Ollie Skip's chances of coming back, separate rating a who's the new head coach at Tottenham, which we don't know still, and that might alter it, yes. But also the injury situation, given out that he's pretty much going to be out for the majority of the summer, and is he going to be fit at the start of the season? Probably not. But the way Stuart was still quite openly talking it up as if we were in with a chance. You know, I've spoken to Ollie, I've spoken to his representative. Clearly, they've indicated quite favourably that they would be receptive to coming back to Norwich, whether it's a loan or a permanent. So I'm thinking if I'm hearing that from people who matter, who make these deals happen, then is there a, is there an Aaron's dimension to that? And that's just me putting two and two together. It might not add up to four, but the fact that there isn't anything speculation-wise happening at the minute, I wouldn't read too much into that. Because ultimately, the other thing I'd say is the clubs who've been linked to him, you know, they're probably looking at players if they're looking for right back still at the Euros at the minute. So I think there'd be an element of the Euros maybe taking away a bit of the focus on a, on a Max Aaron's. But I just I just I just think it could be leading towards maybe a Tottenham exit and maybe Ollie Skip is a part of that deal. And if so, um, that doesn't really need to happen imminently, does it? Because you know wheels can be put in place and then buttons can be pressed whenever between now and the start of the season, pre-season, ideally. But uh, I just I just don't see a scenario, sadly, you know, irrespective of Emmy going, I just don't see a scenario where Max Aarons is an Norwich player. Uh, if not at, from the start of the season, certainly by the end of the window, I just think uh, we've reached the same point we reached with Emmy, and that if if a, a another club are willing to match Norwich's valuation, that deal will get done. So, um, yeah, sadly, because uh, I think uh, he's going to be a bit more difficult to replace maybe than, well, maybe not more difficult, but if you take in Buendia and Aaron's out and that point about Dowell and the defensive side is very valid because if you strip Norwich's complete right flank out of last season, then that, that, is, a, that is a bit of more of a concern in terms of how do you replace them properly, adequately for the money they would be able to spend. So, but then again, that's what Stuart Webber's getting paid for. So, uh, you know, I'm sure he will be, if that is the scenario, he will have a solution in, in his head already. So, no, I don't think Max Aarons will be a Norwich player. And I personally, if I had a pound and I was going to put it anywhere, I'd put it on Tottenham. And hopefully, but hopefully, as an upside, substantial uplift in terms of the bank balance and also Ollie Skip coming back the other way. That would be nice. Yeah, which I think a lot of Norwich fans would go for. It's Steve Hitchin, isn't it? He's head of recruitment, I think, at Spurs. But they've also got a new sporting director, haven't they? Uh, Paratici, who they brought in from Juventus. Yeah. So that adds a, a new dynamic to it all as well. But um, they're obviously going to work very closely together. I, I just think from Max's point of view, you know, England is so strong at right back. But Walker and Trippier within the next couple of years are probably not going to be playing much more international football, you wouldn't have thought. If Max is going to have any chance of competing with Alexander-Arnold and Reese James for that England right-back spot at some point in his career, I think he'll probably be thinking, now's the time I've got to take a step up. Now's the time I've got to be playing for a bigger club and and raise my profile and things like that. And um, he's got a tough job in his hands anyway. Tarek Lamptey at Brighton as well is very highly thought of, isn't he? It's a, a position that uh, England are ridiculously strong with really so um we shall see i can see there's a few comments talking about harrison reed and harry wilson but um i won't go too uh too deep with them as daniel would likes to say um also mentioned sorry i can't see who it was that mentioned it but henry lansbury is also signed for luton which has been uh which follows on from cameron jerome joining luton which was announced um i think at lunchtime just before we i got the story on our website just before we started this um who of course was playing for russ martin's nk dons in league one this season so uh interesting that cam is stepping back up elliot bennett has gone to shrewsbury as well left blackburn so uh, there's a, f- a few stories doing the rounds on uh, uh which are worth worth having a look at which you can read uh, at pinkin.com and of course, we'll keep you up to date with everything as much as we can. Uh, we always have somebody working at the weekend as well at the moment to, to stay on top of any breaking news and things like that and, and keep an eye on the Euros. Um, so, yeah, pinkin.com and the papers, of course. Um, we will catch up with you very soon. This is uh, pretty much our standard slot now, 1 p.m. on a Friday for Window Watch during, during the summer. So um, we'll see you here this time next week um, if you want to catch up with all the latest. But as we sit here, it's still only... What, about two weeks until the players will definitely be back in for pre-season and really stepping things up and, and starting to think about the new season. So we all expected a busy summer 
We know that Norwich has still got a lot of recruitment work to do, ins and outs, but that time frame is starting to come that little bit more condensed, so it's going to be an interesting time. Thanks very much for watching.